Hello and welcome back to our Foxint catalog. From part one, we made a chassis, a very basic chassis, as well as a speed controller, and then put them together. So in part two of this catalog, we're going to cover materials and appearances, sketch constraints and projections, then importing and cleaning up an STL file for internal use, extruding to objects instead of to fixed values, the mirror command, and joints. So let's talk about materials. These boxes, they're they're okay, but they're not they're not the best to look at, especially when they're both the same color. So if we take a look at our chassis here, right click it and go into physical material, it brings up this little um, pop-up that has all sorts of different materials we can choose from. We have various metals and plastics and all sorts of stuff that we can use. So this is gonna be a plastic ant, which means it's gonna be 3D printed probably out of ABS. If we go to the plastic section here, you will see there is an ABS plastic right on top. So I'm gonna click and drag this guy onto the chassis and now it is ABS. Uh, you can do whatever you want with the color. You can right click this and do edit. So I'm gonna go to advanced appearance and I'm just gonna you know, find a, a green that I like. You can also play with the RGB values. Let's do that instead actually. Click on this guy and you know pick a nice team small robots green something like that and then hit apply and now we have a green abs plastic material applied to our chassis so i'll hit escape to get out of there and now if you wanted to change the speed controller you would right click and you'll see that physical material isn't here that's because this is an imported file. If you notice this uh, little chain link here, that's an indicator that this is an imported file. So let's go back to our uh, inbots file and right click this. And here you can see that physical material has appeared. So let's go ahead and go in here. Now this is a PCB board. I don't think there's a material specifically for that. It's also a mixture of a whole bunch of different materials. So I'm just gonna go with copper drag that on there now even though copper is the material we can still change how it looks instead of editing it here I'm actually gonna push a on my keyboard for appearances and you can see it shows the materials we already have uh, silver is my default material and copper is the material we added earlier um, and I just want kind of like a I think I'm gonna go with a black, sort of a, yeah, chrome black I think sort of works. It's a shiny, shiny kind of black. And then I'll close out of there. Now if you right click on this guy and go to properties, it'll tell you some useful information about the physical material of it, like the area density, the mass, like how much it weighs, its volume. Now the physical material, even though it doesn't look like copper, is still copper, so it has the density of copper. So we're gonna exit out of there. We're gonna save. And then if we go back to our main Foxint project, you'll see we have this little yellow triangle appearing everywhere. And that's just a, a message saying that you don't have the latest version of every file that you've implemented. So if we click on this button, it'll fetch the most recent of all of the imported files. And let's make the parent object here, the activated component. And we can see that the changed color appears here in our imported project, as well as in any other file we would have included this uh, component in. So I'll go ahead and save that. So now we have some neat little colors to our chassis. We can also right click our chassis and go to properties. And that'll give us more information about its mass and stuff like that. Now, this will be purely ABS, even at 100% infill, you can't trust this value because 3D printed parts tend to fluctuate with their weight, but uh, I guess that would give you a kind of rough estimate of 100% infill. That's about all you could use Fusion for to estimate a 3D printed part for. It's probably much better to just use a slicer to estimate the weight. So now let's get to work on the drive system of our robot. So I know that I wanna use a 30 to one N20 gear motor as my main drive motor. So let's see if we can go on the internet and find a pre-made CAD instead of building our own. So my favorite place to start off is a website called GrabCAD. And this is a site you can make an account for free to use. 
um, then you can go to your library and then you can search for all sorts of different uh, 3D models and stuff. So I'm going to do a search for an N20 and let's see what we can find. We have this guy here. We have a really detailed one here, but if we take a look at it and then check out the uh, format, it's a solid work part. And unfortunately, the personal license for Fusion 360 doesn't let you import solid work parts. It used to, but it does not anymore. So that is unfortunate. Um, and then we don't want an encoder. We could delete it, but there's also this one down here, but it looks like that's also SolidWorks only. And yeah, those are all SolidWorks parts, unfortunately. So looks like we're going to be using the basic one and there's nothing wrong with that. If we check this out, we have a step file and step files are probably the best type of file you can use to import into Fusion besides a Fusion 360 file, obviously. But uh, you can see this looks pretty good. It even has the coloring for us done. So that is good enough for me. And hit download files. Then we'll open this guy up. Then you can see we have our N20 step. No, I'm not going to buy a WinRAR. So I'm just going to drag this onto my desktop. And then open it back up in Fusion. So to import a file, you go up here to Upload, select Files, and then ignore all the weird stuff on my desktop. And we'll look for our N20 and hit Upload. And it's that simple. Now we have an N20 good to go. There is one more thing we need to check though, since there's a few different gear ratios of N20 motors, we want to make sure the one that we are using has the same dimensions. So close this guy, wait for this guy to load. And with this guy open, let's take a look inside. So here is our motor. Let's uh, measure this dimension by pushing I on our keyboard to bring up the measure tool and then click on this line and that says nine millimeters. So I just so happen to have an N20 motor in front of me and it is also nine millimeters. So that means we do have the correct CAD file and we can use it in our robot. So I'll close out of that since we don't need it anymore. I'm going to right click on the Foxint head component and do a new component and let's call this drive. We'll use this as a component folder to uh, hold all of our drive stuff. So with that activated, we will drag our N20 in and we have a neat little motor inside of our robot now. I'm just going to rotate this to the orientation it's going to be in. and hit OK. So cool, we have a little uh, motor in here now. So I think I'm gonna put the motors um, kind of like over here against the wall, up against those two corners, but then sticking out just like that with the uh, little circle-y bit of the motor poking out, making that flush with the wall. And then, uh, well, and then also centered probably. So something like that. Um, and I'm just I'm just clicking on it and using the mouse to drag it around. It doesn't have any um, constraints or joints on it, so I can just drag it wherever. Um, so yeah, something like that is what we're going to try and achieve. So I'm going to undo all those movements because they're not needed. Now, before making a sketch to manipulate this, I'm going to make sure the chassis is activated first. And then we're going to create a new sketch on the inside wall here. And you can see the, uh, the chassis itself kind of gets in the way. So I'm just going to work on it from the other side. So what we want is basically a square hole that we can fit our motor into. So let's make a rectangle. And we don't know what size that's going to be yet. But I want it to be up against that wall here. And I want it to be in the center. So we're going to use P to bring up the project tool. And what this lets us do is take existing pieces of geometry and project them onto our sketch plane. So you can see clicking on this, or if I were to click on this face, it would bring up this line. So let's click on that. And let's also click on the base plate so we can see where our base plate is here. Get back to that. And now we can see the uh, outline of the innards pretty much. So I still can't click on stuff because the chassis itself is in the way. So I'm going to open that up and I'm going to click the eyeball on the body here so that I can still see the sketch, but not the actual physical material. Now I can see. Now to make this hole here, 
I'm going to hit high on my keyboard again, like we did earlier to make a measurement. And I'm going to click on this line and get the uh, value here. So that's this in inches and that's 12 millimeters. So we can make this 12 millimeters and then hit I again to get this line. And it's this value convert that to millimeters and that is 10 millimeters. So we'll click on this line, hit D 10 millimeters. Now we have the square itself done, but we can still drag it and move it wherever we want. And we don't want that. So we want this line and this line to basically be the same because that's the inside of our uh, inner wall. So I'm gonna click this line and then I'm gonna hit control click and I'm gonna apply what we call a constraint. And a constraint can be found up here in the constraint menu. So I'm going to use the collinear um, constraint which says what it says right there. Whenever you want two lines to share the same path, basically you use the collinear constraint. So clicking that puts those two lines together. And now I just need to center it like so. So there's a few different ways of doing this. I'm gonna do it by moving this out of the way so I know I'm using this line instead of this line. I'm gonna push S to bring up the sketch shortcuts <clears throat> and I'm gonna grab a point. And then I'm gonna move the point around until that triangle shows up. And that triangle means that it's centered. So we'll add that point there. And now you can see this rectangle thing has a center line on it. And then I'm gonna do the same thing on this line here. I will add a center point. And I'm gonna use another constraint called the coincident. So what this constraint does is basically says, I want this point on this spot. So I'm gonna click on that. And I want the center line or the center point we made on the square to be on the center point of the line. And then you'll see that snaps into place. And now all of our sketch lines are black and we have a fully defined sketch. So if we were to extrude this, we could make uh, basically a big rectangular hole by dragging it out. And instead of using the um, join or new body, function of extrude like we've used we can change this to cut and you can see that it cuts a hole um, however big we decide to extrude it to now that's cool and all but we want uh, we want a little wall around this part that lets this little circly bit point out or that lets this little circly bit poke out like we did when we were first visualizing it so I'm going to cancel this actually so let's add that little slot for the circle so you can make a circle here. You can use the shortcut tool. You can use whatever you want. Uh, and we'll throw a circle in there. I'm gonna hide the body again. That sounds like criminal activity. And we want this to be directly in the middle. So we can do that by making a line. We can do that by doing S and then line, or you can actually just push L on your keyboard and it'll bring up a line. And I'm bring, I'm, uh, you can see it turns into a square here and that means the first point will be fixed to that um, intersection there. And I will put that other one here and click. And now we have a line going through the middle. So let's use another constraint called the midpoint. You can see it's a triangle just like uh, when we were adding these guys. And we will click on that. Now it's prompting to select sketch objects or change constraint types. So what this needs is a center point and a line to be centered on. So the point that we want to center is this circle and we want it centered on this line. So doing that snaps it into place. Now this is still blue because we can still make it bigger and smaller. So let's get a look at how big that circle is over here. We're getting four millimeters roughly. So I'll hit that guy push D four millimeters. And now we have a little circle in the middle of our square. Um, if you hover over these, you'll see that this line kind of divides the two faces. Since this line is only used to position the circle and it doesn't actually define the shape that we want, we can convert it to a construction line. And we can do that by pushing X on our keyboard with it selected. And now if we hover over this, it highlights the whole box like it should. We could do something like this and then extrude this, make a hole like that. And that would let us make a little hole to cut this in. 
but the problem is to actually position it here, I want to be able to drop it in from the top. So I'm going to delete that extrude, edit this, turn the body off, and let's add some lines from here to the circle to make like a slot sort of. So um, these are blue because we can move them around all over the place. We want them to be straight up and down. There's a few ways we could do that. We could use the vertical horizontal constraint, which forces lines to be horizontal or vertical. Or we could use the perpendicular tool and, and say uh, that we want this line and this line to be perpendicular to each other. Both methods work, as you can see here. Um, just to be consistent, um, let's use the perpendicular tool for both. All right. So now the angle is locked in, but you can still drag these around um, because they aren't defined fully. So we want this line to go to the edge of the circle, which means we'll use the tangent constraint. Click on the line and click on the circle. And now the line is tangent to the circle and it is black. It has been fully defined. So let's do the same thing to this side and hit finish sketch. Um, looks like my sketch turned invisible. Turn that back on. Um, so now we have a little slot here, but we actually need that to go all the way to the top. So we'll add that in as well. I'm just going to look at this diagonally. I'm going to hit line to add a line. And I actually want this whole thing to be cut out like that. So now for our extrusion, we can select all of this and extrude it by pushing E. And instead of doing a distance where we just drag the arrow or type a value, we're going to change this to two object and it'll extrude to whatever we specify. So I'm going to click on this face and then it'll drag it all the way into that face and make the cut. So this is good because if we change the thickness of this size, if we decide that we want to cut only an eighth inch, but then later we go back and we change the thickness to a quarter inch, it won't go through all the way. And that's a problem, obviously. So by defining based on the uh, face here, it'll always extrude itself to where it needs to go. Now, since we want a little pocket, we actually don't want to go all the way here. We want, uh, we want only this thing to stick out. So we want this distance, which I believe is 0.4 millimeters I measured earlier. So I'm going to set an offset here to negative 0.4 millimeters. So now our cut goes to the end of the face here and then back negative four millimeters. So if we hit okay, we should have a little cutout and I'll hide the sketch so we can see it better. So it goes all the way to that face except for a 0.4 millimeter gap. Now, since we want the actual um, shaft to stick out, we're gonna need to make another hole. So we can do that using the same sketch. So I'll turn that back on. And we want this, this, and this. And I'm holding down control while I click to select multiple faces and then push E. Um, you could also push E and then just click on them. We want that to go all the way to the end like that. And we'll hit OK. So now we have the little cutout that we want. So we can have the motor sitting here it'll stick out like that and we can just drop it in from the top. So let's demonstrate that by making what is called a joint. So when you make a joint, I actually like to have the parent as the activated component. That's pretty much the only time I'm willing to do that. Um, so we can use J to make a joint and you can see that we can click on like center points and faces and edges and anything like that to uh, choose what we want to stick together. So I want to align the front of this circle with uh, that center point of that rounded area. So I'm going to go in here and I want to click on that point on the gray shaft. But if you watch this and I try to mouse over to it, it disappears. That's because I'm hovering over this uh, shaft now. So if you pick the, hover over the face you want and then hold down control, it'll lock in that face as your selection and you can only pick something on that face now. So I can click on that. And then we will go over here 
and you can see the same thing in action. If I try to click on that middle point, it'll go away. But if I click on, or if I hover over this face, hold down control, now I can only select points on this face and that lets me click on this. And then our motor flies into place, except it's backwards, but that's okay. We can just go over here on the joint menu to flip. And there we go. Now we have our motor in place. So I did make one mistake. This isn't a four millimeter diameter hole. It's uh, 3.9 millimeters. So we can fix this by going back to the sketch here and we can change the diameter of this hole to 3.9 millimeters. And there you can see that fits nice and snugly. We actually don't want it to be that tight of a fit. If we look at this, there's literally no space um, between the wall there. And if we look at this head on, it looks like the measurement for the length of this thing is also wrong. So I'm gonna hide the chassis and we can measure this by pushing I and I'm gonna click on this face, holding down control and click on this face, and that'll give us that distance. So I will take this distance, convert that to millimeters real quick, and we get 0.6 millimeters. So when we did this extrude, and we did 0.4, that should have been 0.6. There we go. So now we're nice and snug here. Now, in real life, when you're 3D printing something like this, you don't want to use the exact measurements. You want some wiggle room. Otherwise, it'll be an impossibly tight fit and nothing will fit. So I talked to 3D printing expert Isaac Mallers. You might know him as the creator of DBSC. And he gave me some values for various fittings of 3D printed holes. So if you want a press fit, you make the hole 1.5 millimeters bigger. If you want a snug fit, 0.25 millimeters, and for slip fit, 0.35 millimeters. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a great chance to make some more parameters. So let's add some more. We'll call this one press fit. And we'll do 0.15. We'll change this to millimeters. I apologize for mixing inches and millimeters so much, but that's life sometimes. And then we'll do snug fit. and slip fit. Cool, so with all those in there, we'll hit okay. So let's readjust our sketch with those fits in mind. I will go back to our chassis here, turn this sketch on and double click in here to take a look. So instead of uh, 12 millimeters, we'll do 12 millimeters plus, um, let's do snug fit. So that'll make it a tiny bit wider. And then we'll do the same thing with our hole plus snug fit and the height also plus snug fit. So now if we finish the sketch and I will make the Foxen component the activated component so everything is purely visible, hide this sketch so we can get a better look. Um, now you can see we have a little bit of a wiggle room here and same thing if we look against this wall there's also a tiny bit of space in there so that'll be great for just for sliding in our motor in and we won't we won't have to do any sanding or grinding or anything like that so if we were to just drop the motor in here it would just sort of fall over because there's nothing holding it up so let's add a little support to it so the chassis is my activated component so I'll create a new sketch on the base plate and I'll just make a little rectangle to sort of hold this all up. So clicking on this intersection for the first point, and then the first point, or the second point will be out here somewhere. So we're gonna want uh, not only a support, but we're gonna also make it turn into a wall when it gets higher. So I'm gonna add another set of lines here to be our wall. And we need to make everything uh, fully defined. So the wall is going to be a snug fit. So let's project with the P key, get some of the motor geometry, and we'll say the distance from here to the motor. Um, so actually, see how it's saying uh, it's saying 0.1 degrees. That's because the lines are not parallel. So. Let's uh, click on this guy and use horizontal vertical to make it a straight line. 
Now we'll select these two. Come on. Hit D and we'll say snug fit. Or actually it should be snug fit divided by two because we want the total area here. So like that side has space and that side has space. Um, so yeah, snug fit divided by two. And then this one, same thing, except this one will just be snug fit because I have it pushed up right against the wall here. And I'm doing that because uh, I don't wanna make this wall any thinner. So we're gonna use all of the snug fit extra space on the backside. So those lines are defined. Now it's just how thick do we want the walls to be? So let's try an eighth of an inch. And then we'll do the same thing here. So click, control click, D. And instead of typing it again, you can just click on another dimension and that'll automatically change it. So if I change this to a 16th, it updates both. And actually now that I see that, I think a 16th inch will do us just fine. So let's select all these guys. I'm just holding down control while I click and we'll do extrude. And instead of making a new body, we want to join so that it's still one piece. And we will change distance to two object. And I'll hide the electronics here, or sorry, hide the drive. And we just want it to go to this space basically. And now we have a cool little platform for our motor to rest on. Turn the drive back on, there we go. And let's also extrude those walls up. So we'll go back to this guy again, select just the wall part this time. We'll do another extrude. And we want this to go basically to the top of the motor. So we'll do two and then click on that top face. All right, and now with those two extrudes put together, we have this little cubby that we can put our motors in. So doing that has covered up the back of the motor here. So our terminal ends and the back circular bit are covered up. So we need to kind of cut a hole here for uh, those. So chassis is active. We're gonna create a new sketch on the back here. Um, so I wanna project this. So I'm gonna hide the body of the chassis. I'm gonna hit P for project. And we'll project that back um, geometry. Put the body back on. And I'm thinking we can just kind of put a line like this horizontal line um, and just kind of have it barely under the uh, back of the motor here. So I'm gonna pick, take a line that goes directly down and make it a vertical line, construction line. And then I'll say from that point until here, not the line, the point to here. And we'll say like slip fit, that's what I mean. Okay. And, uh, and then we can just kind of just cut all this out. Extrude from distance to object and the object will just be back here. And when we do that, it, technically it's cutting through the motor right now, but since it's an imported part, um, you don't have to worry about it. But just in case you wanna make sure you're cutting only the chassis. So it's always nice to open up objects to cut and check or uncheck anything that you don't want uh, being cut. So we'll hit okay there. And now we have a little lip back here and that'll keep the motor secure and we can get to the wires. So that's looking pretty good. Um, so now we would do that to all the other sides. So you're thinking, oh man, I have to do all that again, but no, you don't actually. So we're gonna use a tool called the mirror command. So I'll hit S to bring up the menu, I'll type mirror. And we want uh, just, just mirror, none of the other options there. And what this tool lets us do is uh, takes either faces, bodies, features, or components, and then mirror them to uh, kind of clone them across the plane. So we're gonna keep this on features, and now it's asking for the objects we want. So we can actually not click on anything here, but click on the objects in the timeline, and then I'll hold down control so I can select multiple of these. So we're gonna just click on all the extrude commands that we used to make that. So all those guys. Um, and then we'll select our mirror plane. So this is the uh, plane we want to mirror across. So I'm gonna pick this plane here that kind of cuts the chassis in half. And if we click on that, you can see it's kind of forming the shape of what it'll look like on the other side here. 
Um, then our last option is the calculation method. So optimize, identical, and adjust, these all do the same thing. It's just the optimized version will run faster, then identical will run faster than adjust, and adjust is the slowest version. So they all do the same thing. It kind of depends on the computation you're doing. So if optimize doesn't work, do identical. If identical doesn't work, do adjust. So let's see if optimize works. And it did not get the bottom one here. So let's double click on this to change it, and let's try identical and that did work okay so now we have that other side done and now we want to get these front parts as well so we're going to do another mirror and we'll select those again and for our plane we'll do this one that cuts it in half the other direction now you see the um, gray preview is only showing the left side. It's not doing the right side because we also need to copy that mirror over. So I'll go back to objects here, control click on the mirror, and now both are in the preview. So let's try optimized. Uh, nope. So we'll go down to identical, and that one worked. Cool. So now we have our four little motor mounts. So now let's add some wheel hubs to the drive system. We'll go online and instead of looking for a step file, let's try an STL file. And here we are on Thingiverse. Um, so this is another place where you can get 3D models, but I think they're more STL focused. They're not too big on step files. Um, so we're gonna look for the small hub, which was a hub I designed. It is a super simple motor hub for, or a wheel hub. So it's it's as simple as you can get pretty much. It's a, it's a hub with a hole in it for the shaft and then you just glue the wheel on so let's download this and that'll give us a zip file and then just like before we'll grab the files and we'll drag this onto our desktop and then back to fusion we'll hit upload and do the same thing we'll select the file and get that imported you typically don't want to import STLs because their geometry is defined with polygons instead of surfaces and rounded corners and stuff like that. Um, you'll see what I mean in a sec here when we open it up. So if you take a look at this guy, it looks pretty different. We have all these weird lines. Um, the surfaces aren't smooth. They're um, polygons, like I said, triangles and stuff like that. Um, and this is a problem for us because if we want to add a joint to this section here. Um, it doesn't know that it's a circle because of all these lines and it, and it isn't a circle technically. So to convert this, um, we need to play with it a little bit. So the first thing we wanna do is go over to bodies here and you see that this is a mesh body, not a standard body. So let's convert that to a B rep, which is our typical fusion body. Um, so now it looks a little more familiar, but we still have a million of these lines everywhere. Um, there's a lot of videos on how to clean up STL files and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of an ordeal. So we're just gonna change what we have to change. We're gonna go to the surface tab up here and that's a, a new tab we've never gone to before. This is where you handle um, your mesh and surface type stuff. Um, so we're gonna use a tool called Merge. And what you can do is click on a face and then click on a face next to it and that somehow tells Fusion that any face on the same plane should just be one face. So we'll hit OK on there. Oh, and it kind of missed some there. I'll grab the others and then do another merge. Okay, so now that's a nice flat surface. This is a nice flat surface, and it got this. What Fusion struggles with um, in STLs is rounded features like this. So um, we're going to clean up just this inside because it's, a, it's kind of a bit of an ordeal, like I said. So the issue is if we zoom in here, see how this isn't a perfectly round shape? If we look at it here, it kind of zigzags. So it, it comes out and then it comes back in and it's like a wavy pattern. It's not a perfectly round pattern. And that's where our problems come from when trying to merge. There's a video um, that I found about cleaning up rounded edges like this. The guy's method takes forever and I have a faster way. So I'm gonna to link to his slower way if you wanna see that, um, but I'm gonna show you guys the faster way. 
So with this, uh, we only have one component, so that's gonna be our activated component. We're gonna add a new sketch. We're gonna put it on here. And what we basically wanna do is cut out this whole thing and then re-add it. So that's not as bad as a, as bad of a task as you might think. So um, we want to create a circle now, sometimes you can't trust the origin of an STL file because who knows um, how they centered it. So just to be safe, instead of using this to define our middle point, which looks like it's fine, but uh, just as an example, we're gonna pretend that this isn't here or it's off center or something like that. We're gonna use the project tool and we're gonna zoom way in here and we're gonna grab three points um, on the inside like the, the biggest diameter that we can find here. So three of those guys, we'll hit okay. And then we're gonna make a circle, but not just any circle, we're gonna do a three point circle. And then we'll select those three points. And then this will give us a guaranteed um, circle with the correct circumference. All right, so next thing we wanna do is offset this by a very tiny amount. So we wanna offset this and this line here, but we can only do a closed path. And with this extra line here, it's not closed. So we're gonna push S again, and we're gonna pick break. And uh, I know we're going through a lot of tools here, but <laughs> this is what we have to do to deal with STLs. And I'm gonna click on this line here, and you can see those red X's appear. That means that's where it's going to break. So with that now broken, we can click on this and delete it. And now we have our trusted rounded circle with our um, notch here. So let's select these guys, hit offset, and we'll just do 0.1 millimeters. It just needs to be big enough to deal with all these zigzags, but small enough so that it doesn't interfere with any of the other geometry. So 0.1 is perfectly fine. Um, so we'll hit okay there. And then we're gonna take this and this um, shape and we'll get that too. We'll hit extrude and we're just gonna slice through this entire thing. And you can see we're leaving a, uh, a smooth pattern underneath all the triangles. Like if you look in here, it's perfectly smooth. We're getting rid of, we're getting rid of all those weird lines. If you, if you zoom way in, I didn't click on every single one of these tiny lines. So let's cancel that and hide the body and to make sure we get every single one of those little tiny ones, we're just gonna, we're just gonna wide select box select over all of those. Now, if we zoom in, those are all selected. Um, so we can turn the body back on, extrude. Now we can do our cut. Bam. Okay. So this hole is 0.1 millimeters bigger than uh, what it should be. So to fix that, we're gonna use another tool called offset face. And we'll select one of these faces. And then you can see this kind of uh, it's kind of like an extrude, but it does it specifically to the geometry of an existing face. So we'll do 0.1 millimeters, except we type it correctly, 0.1 millimeter. There we go. Um, and then we'll also get this side and then also that side. And I'm just control clicking like I've been doing everywhere else. And then we'll hit okay. So now, since this is a perfectly round, a truly round surface instead of a polygonal triangle mess, um, we can use the, uh, curvature here to get a center point and use it in our joint. So we'll say, actually, before we go, let me add a material to this guy. And I'll just change the appearance. The uh, material isn't important. So I'll just do a search for a green. And actually, I think I might make the chassis the same green. Yeah, just a plastic matte green. Sounds good. Save that. So I dragged the hub back into the project and noticed that it's really, really tiny. The problem comes from STL files being unitless. So they just say 24. They don't say millimeters or inches or anything like that. They just give numbers by themselves. So I think the problem is that this STL was in centimeters actually, um, and then converted into inches. So to scale that, we can use the scale tool We'll select this as our entity, and then our scale point doesn't really matter. I'll just pick something random here. And we just need to do 2.54. If you're doing millimeters, two inches, you would do 25.4, I believe. Um, you can just kind of Google the values that you need to find. So 
that looks like we're correct. We need basically this diameter should be a l around three millimeters. Um, yeah, so 3.25 millimeters there. So we are good. Save that. So now with our small hub correctly sized, let's add it to the motor. So we're going to make another joint. For our first component, we're going to grab that cross that we made. Um, this comes up just because there's a rounded surface here. So if we didn't convert all the polygonal stuff to a truly, uh, to a truly round surface, uh, that center wouldn't appear. So we'll grab that. And then we'll fly around over here and we'll add that to this same cross section. And I like to space using these handles here to uh, just to make sure things don't rub together by a hundredth of an inch. So something like that's fine. That way the motor or the hub isn't rubbing against the chassis and we'll hit OK. So that's all set. Um, let's add a wheel to the hub. And oh, this needs to be in the drive um, component folder. So let's make drive active and we'll make a new component and we'll just call it wheel. These are gonna be finger tech uh, X diameter by 0.5 inch thick wheels. So we'll create a new sketch and I'll create the sketch on the hub itself actually. And I'll hit S to make a circle and I'll grab the center point here, which it is not grabbing because of all the stuff in the way. So let's uh, close out of that. We're gonna right click on drive and we'll hit isolate and everything goes away except for drive. Let's also hide the motor. So now we just have a hub and our wheel. So go back into the sketch, S circle. It's not going, so we need to project it and we'll project the round bit here, hit okay. And you can see doing that adds our center point so we can add a circle to that. So this will be the diameter of the wheels. Let's try two inch wheels. We'll see if we change that later. We could make a parameter for it, but we'll uh, just leave that for now. And then we'll make another circle for the inside of the wheel and that's gonna match our hub. So I'm just gonna click on the hub here. And then with that selected, we can grab this face and that face, extrude to 0.5 inches and we have a wheel. Woo! Let's add a material to it. So technically they're foam wheels. Um, I don't think there's a foam material. So I'm just gonna use rubber because that looks like a wheel. Yeah, rubber black sounds good to me. Cool. Um, and then we will right click on drive and do unisolate so we can see everything else. And then make the Foxint parent the active component so we can take a look at our work here. So that's pretty neat. Oh, and let's uh, turn the motor back on. There we go. So that's looking pretty good. Uh, two inches might be too big. So let's go back into this sketch and do 1.5. Um, yeah, I guess as long as the bottom touches the ground, 1.5 looks good. So now to copy all these everywhere, um, I don't have a neat trick for it. We're gonna have to manually copy and paste, but we can speed it up by doing a new component. And let's just call this drive unit. And a drive unit will contain a motor, a hub and a wheel and then we'll put that inside of drive unit. And now we can just copy and paste drive unit, copy, paste. Now, uh, the difference between paste and paste new is important. If you just do paste, um, it is a copy. And if you change the original, the copy will also change. If you do paste new, you will copy it. And if you change the original, the copy will not change. So we're just gonna do normal paste so if we decide to change the wheels or something like that, all the other copies will be updated. So we can rotate that by 180 degrees and uh, copy another one. For some reason, control C, control V doesn't work and I have to right click, but fusion can be weird sometimes. Paste 
paste. And I'm pasting them into the parent uh, folder that I want them in. And you can also see that it brings the joints we made along with them. So those joints are already uh, copied. And you know, we should have actually jointed the wheel to the hub before we did this. So let's go back in time here. Now, instead of doing a joint, I'm just gonna do Shift J to make an as built joint. That way you don't have to uh, specify the specific points you want. You can just click on the two different things and say, okay, those are glued together now. So now our wheel is uh, fixed. And actually a problem that we haven't addressed yet is that the chassis needs to be um, what we call grounded. So you, you can see how I can move it. Uh, we do not wanna be able to move it. We need a component to be our, our, our fixed space. So I'm going to right click chassis and pick ground and that will keep it uh, bolted to the ground pretty much. Okay. And I'll actually move this ground. I'm gonna drag it way back here to when we first uh, made it. So it's been grounded that entire time. Um, one neat thing we can do here is instead of uh, this joint that it's not letting me click on, not that joint, this joint, I'm double clicking to edit it. If we go to motion, let's change that from rigid to revolute. That way our wheel can actually spin around in the CAD drawing. So that's pretty cool. Look at that. Vroom, vroom. Now, if we continue on and do our copy pastes again, um, you can see that the wheel rotate has also transferred over because we made that change back in time before the copy was made. So let's uh, get these locked down now. I'm gonna have to hide the wheel so I can see, or hide the, yeah, hide the wheel and the hub so I can see those um, rounded parts again. Uh, I guess I'll capture the position for now just so that they don't move around. And then you know the drill here making joints and then we'll turn those back on and then our wheel turns when we drag on it cool and then if you want to know which uh, part you're clicking on you can see it kind of makes this blue line under it so I, I wanted to know which wheel I should hide so I click on this and that's oh that's drive unit 2 so I can go in here hide the wheel hide the hub Those guys, now I have a cool little monster truck looking robot. So those, these all turn now. And if we try to drag away, it doesn't move the chassis. So that is perfect. Now I like to hide the joints because they're kind of annoying. So we can hit that and then we can go into drive. Also find joints, get rid of those as well. All right, we're coming along nicely on this thing. All right, that'll do it for part two of our Foxint catalog. I know that I said the videos were going to be shorter and ended up being like twice as long, but I really wanted to get the uh, the mirror and the drive unit copied with all of the wheels and stuff before finishing up this part. So it ended up being a little bit longer. Um, definitely let me know if you want shorter videos or videos this long or something in between. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask those in the comments and I will be happy to answer those for you. Also make sure you're subscribed so you're notified when the next part comes out. And with that, I will see you all next time.